Happy Father's Day. <laughs> I wanted to honor the dads today. One thing, we have some books in the back, on the back table, that um, any dads, if you want to look over those and take one, uh, they're especially for you. Um, but also, I'd like to take some time to pray for all the dads that are here. So if you're a dad, would you mind standing up and we'll just have a moment where we Go to the Lord in prayer, asking his blessing upon your lives. Dear Lord, we ask your blessing on each uh, father that's here today. And we pray that you'd let him know that he's not alone in the task that you've given to him to provide for and to support those under his care. Father, we ask that you'd show him how much you delight in his work and affirm the value of whatever you have given him to do, both as a father and as a child of yours. Confirm his worth daily so he has no reason to doubt whether he is loved in the eyes of his heavenly Father. Create in him a deep sense of trust in you, knowing that he can count on you to help lead and protect those dependent on him. Let him know that every unselfish act of love and encouragement he has offered has been a gift that you receive gladly. Show him how effective the prayers of a godly man really are and what a difference he has and can make to those around him no matter how big or small the assignment. Speak deep into his spirit the powerful words he longs to hear from you, that nothing can ever separate him from your love. Help him to grasp firmly the promises of your word, standing with faith on the things you declare are true. Reward him for his faithfulness, past, present, and future, assuring him that true success and satisfaction don't lie in his accomplishments or accolades, but in the steadfast Christ-like character you are forming in him. Also demonstrate to him your amazing grace and forgiveness as he seeks to love and know you with all of his heart, soul, and mind. Release him from unwanted burdens of false guilt and bless him for his willingness to keep short accounts with you, forgiving both himself and others. Help him to see his children through your eyes, realizing that in your hands is the safest place they can ever be. Strengthen his confidence in the only one who can bring good out of any situation. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks, dads. Today we're going to pause our study in the book of Joshua and we're going to take some time to look at what it means to be a godly dad. And this is certainly one of the hardest yes, most, yet most important roles for any man. And I came across some things that I, I thought uh, were rather light, and I wanted to share those to begin with. And the first is called, um, Things You'll Never Hear a Dad Say. Things You'll Never Hear a Dad Say. Well, what about that? I'm lost. Looks like we'll have to stop and ask for directions. I notice that all your friends have a certain hostile attitude. I like that. Here's a credit card and the keys to my new car. Go crazy. Your mother and I are going away for the weekend. You might want to consider throwing a party. <laughs> What'd you go and get a job for? I have plenty of money for you to spend. You ever hear any of those? Probably not, huh? Uh, another one I came across I liked, it was, uh, it's about, uh, said after putting their three-year-old child, Brian, to bed, his parents heard muffled sobs coming from his room one night. Rushing back in, they found the child was crying hysterically when he saw them. He told his parents that he had accidentally swallowed a penny and was sure he would die now. The father, in an attempt to sober him down, took out a penny from his pocket, pretended to pull it out from Brian's ear. The child was really thrilled and stopped crying at once. In a flash, he snatched the penny from his dad's hand, swallowed it, and then cheerfully demanded, do it again, Dad. <laughs> I like this one. While having their evening dinner together, a little girl looked up at her father and said, Daddy, you're the boss of this family, right? The father was very pleased to hear it and confidently replied, replied yes, my little princess. The girl then continued, that's because Mommy put you in charge, right? And then the last one says, so a small boy came up to his dad and meekly said, Daddy, Daddy, can I have another glass of water, please? The dad replied, but I've given you ten glasses of water already, son. The little boy then said, oh, yes, Daddy, but the bedroom's still on fire. 
dads have an important but difficult role. In Ephesians 6, 4, dads are instructed to bring up their children in the training and instruction of the Lord. But sadly enough, uh, we don't all come from homes where we are taught from the Bible what that involves or given good role models of what that looks like. This week as I was uh, studying, I came across an article by a pastor named Stephen Cole, and the article is called Shepherding Your Family. And some of the thoughts that I have today as I put together this sermon are inspired by his, his article and, and the keen insight he had in comparing what it means to lead your family with Jesus being our good shepherd. And so that's what I'm kind of uh, going to build this theme around in John chapter 10, that we as dads are called to shepherd our family. And so there are at least six things that this passage teaches us about a good shepherd. And I think it applies to dads as well. And the first one is, to shepherd your family, you must first know the good shepherd and lead your family to know him well. Look at John chapter 10 and, and verse 9. It says, I am the gate, this is Jesus speaking, if anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will come in and out and find pasture. The first thing is that uh, the dad as the family shepherd needs to have a relationship with God himself. Jesus calls himself the door or the gate. And so we must go through him to have eternal life. In ancient times, the shepherds uh, usually guarded the opening of the corral to keep the sheep in and the thieves out, or they hired a gatekeeper to do the same thing. And finding pasture in this verse speaks of spiritual nutrition and a full life. And going through him means relying on him as the only way to God and to this abundant life. And so parents must have a first-hand knowledge of the Lord that's genuine and growing. In other words, our faith must be real. It isn't borrowed. We don't get it from somebody else. Um, it must be real and it must be lived out. I remember when I was in college, one of the assignments that we had to do in our our church college group was to um, go door to door and to do a spiritual survey and talk to people and pray for opportunities maybe to share Christ with people. And that was probably one of the toughest things for me to do. Going door to door is not my thing. And probably many of you wouldn't, wouldn't uh, sign up for that either. But there were some interesting opportunities. And one of them I'll never forget as I was talking to the gentleman that uh, answered the door, he kept talking about his wife and how she was involved in church and she was the Sunday school superintendent and she had done all these things. And I remember asking him, well, what about you? What about you and your relationship with God? And he didn't really want to talk about it. He just kept going back to, well, my wife's really involved in this and she does all these things. And, and you know, I, I think sometimes we use that as an excuse, whether it's our parents or grandparents or our spouse but to be a good shepherd of our family, it has to be personal to ourselves. In many of the surveys that they've done and the studies they've done about why children turn away from the faith, the main reason is because it's not lived out in their home. That they see the hypocrisy of their parents that talk about the need to live spiritually and for the Lord, yet they don't live it. And so that's the very first thing, to be a good shepherd of your family is to have that personal relationship with Jesus Christ. It can't be just a, a religious habit that really doesn't change our life. Going to church is important. It helps us um, learn more about God. It equips us in the faith. It, it gives us opportunities to serve one another and enjoy Christian fellowship. But going to church by itself doesn't equal being a Christian. We must go to Jesus, the Good Shepherd, and put our faith in him. The second thought is a, a good family shepherd knows each member of his family on a deep and personal level. Uh, it has to do with not just a relationship with God, but a good relationship with our children. Look at verses 3 to 5. It says, The gatekeeper opens it for him, and the sheep hear his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought all his own outside, he goes ahead of them. The sheep follow him because they know his voice. They will never follow a stranger. Instead, they will run away from him because they don't know the voice of strangers. And then in 14, it says, I am the good shepherd. 
I know my own, and they know me. Well, in the context, this is talking about Jesus. The fact that Jesus knows each one of us that have faith in him. He knows his sheep. He, he, uh, he calls them, and they, and they hear his voice, and hopefully you've experienced that as you've read God's word and as you've been involved in worship, and you, you hear God through his word, and you know his voice. You know when he's, he's speaking to you. But it also talks about, in application, as parents, do we have that relationship with our kids? Um, it says they, he knows them by name. And in scripture, knowing a person's name means to know them on a deep level. Not just, you know, all their names. I remember um, uh, Ben Dua had 15 kids and he had a list that had the names and the birthdays. Isn't that right, Doug? He had a, he had a list. And I, I remember, how in the world can you remember all that stuff? So I probably would have a list too if I had 15 kids. Um, two kids, sometimes I forget their birthdays. But uh, the idea here isn't just that, you know, when you're yelling at your kid, you give them the right name. You know, you yell the right name. Because sometimes my mom used to mix us up because we are all ours. It was Richard, Robert, and Ronald. And so sometimes she'd say, Richard, stop. I mean, Robert, stop. Ron, Ron stop that. You know. And, and so it's more than that. It, it's knowing their likes. It's knowing their dislikes. It's knowing their personality. It's knowing their temperament. It, it's having an idea of what things excite them or what, what things uh, they really like to do so that you can enjoy them and you can offer them gifts that are meaningful to them. It also involves quality time. Uh, shared experiences. I think it's important for dads, especially busy dads that are gone a lot at work or, or have to go away on business trips a lot, to make sure they carve out time individually with their kids. We, we used to call it dating our kids, that we would have a special day, not with the whole family, but just one-on-one -on -one with, the, with the kids. And, and I think that's helpful. And, and as you do that, it develops the relationship. And part of that isn't just lecturing. I used to have an uncle that every time I, I saw him, I'd try to avoid him because he'd always lecture me. He'd always take me aside, and he knew because my dad died when I was young that somehow he needed to fill the role of the, of the family lecturer. And so I would always avoid him. But, you know, being a good shepherd means you listen, too. And you ask questions, and you show interest in what they're interested in. One thing that I remember hearing, and I, I wrote it down uh, real early on in my spiritual walk as I was maturing in my faith, was related to parenting. And it said, rules without relationship result in rebellion. Rules without relationship results in rebellion. It doesn't say you don't have rules. Rules are important. You, you got to have rules. You have to have structure. You have to teach them the right way to go. You have to help them understand about discipline. But you also need a relationship. And if you put those together, rules and relationship, chances are there'll be way less rebellion. Sometimes there's still rebellion, but certainly there's more rebellion when there's rules without relationship. The third thing is a good family shepherd provides the right example. This is the idea of being a role model. In verse 4 when it says, When he has brought all his own outside, he goes ahead of them. The sheep follow him because they know his voice. Goes ahead of them. That's the idea that when you're a leader, you're willing to go before and, and show the way. I remember I had a professor one time that talked a lot about the importance of mentoring and he said one thing in, in finding as a, a mentor, especially as a guy, is to find another man that's further along than you. And, and that the role of the mentor is, is as you're walking through life and as you're progressing, that you look back and you see your mentee and you say, come on, you can do it. Follow me, you can do it. But it doesn't work if you just say, here's what you're supposed to do, and you don't do it yourself. You need to be the model. You need to show the way. And you need to call the younger person, whether it's a, a, an actual son or daughter or it's just somebody that, that you're mentoring, that, that you believe in them, that, that they can come along, but you need to be the role model. 
According to studies, dads are the biggest single factor in determining whether or not the children in a home will continue to attend church when they're grown. I'll never forget, uh, I often don't have people ask me these questions that are like to a baseball player. It's like a, a fastball that's not fast right in your sweet spot and you're just ready to hit it. But that happened one time. There was, a, there was a guy that asked me, he said, how important are things like Awana and Sunday school? Do you see really the, the difference that that can make in, in children's lives? And I said, certainly we can. But you know what the, the biggest issue or the biggest factor in assuring that a child is going to grow and hold on to their faith? It's the dad leading the way. It's the dad showing it. It's the dad taking them to church, not dropping them off at church. It's the dad instructing them and taking time with them and praying with them and, and helping them see what it really means to follow Christ. And if we want to be good shepherds and we want our kids or our grandkids or those that we're mentoring to follow us and to follow our voice, we must use words to build them up, not tear them down. You know, that must be something that was very prevalent in biblical times. Because in the book of Ephesians, it, it gives instructions to fathers and to mothers and to children. And it's interesting that there's a specific instruction given to fathers in Ephesians 6.4. It says, fathers, do not stir up anger in your children. In Colossians, it talks about, about uh, not exasperating them. And I think for some reason that's something that maybe dads have a tendency to do more than moms. That, that it's easy to get angry. It's easy to get frustrated. It's easy to lose our patience. And if we do that all the time without building them up, they might hear our voice. They might even recognize our voice, but they're not going to follow it. There's going to come a time when they're not going to listen anymore. The fourth thing is a good family shepherd provides spiritual nourishment. Look at verses 9 and 10. It says, I am the gate. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved, and he will come in and go out and find pasture. A thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come so that they might have life and have it in abundance. This is the idea of the dad as a spiritual leader. And part of that role is that we must lead our families to the word of God. In the illustration or the analogy here, it's talking about pasture. The sheep need good pasture to feed on. And our kids need spiritual food as well. And so as dads, as the family shepherd, we need to lead them to the word of God. And that can take place a lot of different ways, and it depends maybe on the age of your children. It might be family devotions. We'd always find a book. There, there was a couple of really good books, a one-year book of devotions, and we'd read those at night before the kids went to bed. I know, I know some families, they do it right after supper. They have a, a little devotional time. Um, it may not have to be done every day, but it, that helps. It instills a, a, a pattern. Uh, praying together is important. Uh, listening and answering questions. That's an important role as well. In Deuteronomy 6, 6 and 7, it says, These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. That's the idea that it has to be personal to you. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. The idea there is that it happens all the time. It doesn't have to happen at a, at a formal time. It can happen at, just casually. As you do life together, you get opportunities to teach them and to instruct them. And I think to do this well, we need to continue to be students of the Bible. We need to continue to grow and keep up and, and lead them. You know, one of the things we did with our kids as they got a little bit older in our devotion time is when they got to be teenagers, we asked them, tomorrow or next week, I want you to lead us. I want you to find a passage of scripture that you find meaningful and would you lead the family just in a real short couple thoughts. And that was helpful. That challenged them. And that encouraged them that they could get into the word for themselves as well. 
And I, and I think it's important that we show them how God's word is helpful in their life. It isn't just something for church, that you use teachable moments, that when something happens where there's a disappointment, maybe there was something they were really counting on and they weren't able to achieve it. And it gives you an opportunity to go to the word and encourage them and say, you know what, this is what God says. This is how God feels about you. This, this is what, what he thinks about how you should handle disappointment or conflicts. There isn't a family where kids don't come home really upset because someone picked on them or someone tripped them or someone was mean to them. And again, we can use those teachable moments to help our kids understand what's God's perspective on this? Uh, do we want to try to figure out how to get them back? Or, or do we want to learn how to forgive them? Um, or prayer. Maybe they're really troubled. Maybe they're filled with anxiety or fear. And you can lead them into going to God in prayer and releasing those things to him. Godly priorities, all, all kinds of things, uh, relationships. Uh, there's so many ways that we can instruct our kids. And that's one of the things I really appreciate about our men's ministry is that there's real practical topics we talk about, about parenting and about how to equip our kids for life. And I find that very, very valuable. The fifth one is a good family shepherd protects his family from danger. Verses 10 to 13. It says, A thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come so that they might have life and have it in abundance. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand, since he is not the shepherd and doesn't own the sheep, leaves them and runs away when he sees a wolf coming. The wolf then snatches and scatters them. This happens because he's a hired hand and doesn't care about the sheep. The family shepherd, he has more invested than the hired man. These are his kids. These are his family. This is, this is the most important part of his life other than his faith in God. And so he's going to protect them physically and morally and, and spiritually. And just as we'd never allow a stranger to come into our home and teach our children things like disrespecting their parents or to be involved in immoral and perverted sexual relationships or to use foul language or to dress inappropriately, so we must guard them from these influences that come into our home. And you say, how do those influences come into our home? Well, it's, it's not hard to find them through television, through movies, through uh, video games, social media, friends, parents, we have that responsibility to protect our kids. That we would protect them from, you know, some physical assault or some bully or some, you know, other thing that would endanger them. But what about mentally and spiritually? Are we guarding them in this area? And that's something that we need to be vigilant about. Because it seems like more than ever, our culture is trying to form our kids into a, a certain mindset and, and a certain way of speaking and living and, and acting. And we're given the responsibility as dads, as shepherds, to care for those that God has entrusted to us. And you notice also in, the, in those verses, all of this comes out of a genuine love and care for the sheep. That's what the good shepherd does because those are his sheep and he loves his sheep. He cares about them. He, he doesn't just turn them over to the hired professional. And so don't expect daycare providers as good as they might be or teachers or friends or Sunday school or, or youth group to do your job. It's your responsibility to protect them and to teach them and to raise them in the right way. And then the last one, Number six is a good family shepherd serves his family. In verse 11 it says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. In 15 it says, just as the father knows me and I know the father, I lay down my life for the sheep. And then 17 and 18, this is why the father loves me, because I lay down my life so that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down on my own. I have the right to lay it down and I have the right to take it up again. I have received this commandment from my father. Over and over again it says the shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. 
What does that mean for us? Well, hopefully it doesn't mean that there'll come a day where we have to give our life physically for our kids, but it could. And, and I believe probably most, if not all of us, would do that for our kids because we love them that much. And you know, sometimes a, a one decision thing like that might even be easier than a day-by-day -day kind of decision to make sacrifices for your family. Um, serving them. Serving them involves figuring out what their real needs are and putting those ahead of your own wants and desires. The, their real needs will depend upon their age and their maturity level. And so what that means is when we serve our kids, it doesn't mean we give them everything we want, uh, they want, everything that they ask. You might think that's serving them when really that's spoiling them. And that there are times when we have to say no and we have to teach them. There are times that they need discipline. I know there are some parents that have the wrong idea that their goal is to be friends with their kids. And if you decide you're going to do that, I feel sorry for you because that's not going to work well. And it isn't really the best thing for your kids it's really for you so that they'll like you but our responsibility is to sacrifice what we might want what we might think we need for what they definitely need um, our goal isn't for them to like us hopefully they will sometimes it takes a while it takes till they're older or a lot older um, but our, our goal and our responsibility is to help them become godly responsible unselfish, mature adults. And sometimes that means sacrifice on our part. Parents are to provide for their children, not the other way around. You know, I've seen a lot of wrong examples. Um, one is child actors who are pressured to make money for their parents. I was watching a, a movie about, it was a real life movie about a, a, a young man who was an actor from when he was a little kid. And it was just a terrible story about how his dad lived off of him, off of his money and pressured him and just how messed up he got because of that. Uh, also, it happens when parents try to live their dream through their kids, whether it's sports or awards or popularity. Um, it's not even often the child's dream, but it's the parent's dream. That isn't sacrificing. Or children who fill an emotional support role sometimes for single parents or parents in conflict that because the relationship between the mom and dad aren't good, they rely on the kids and they look to the kids to give them the support they need. Rather good examples are, are parents that they study their kids. They see what they're good at. They encourage them in those areas. You, you lift them up and, and you take an interest in the things they're interested in. It's, it's being proud of them and praising them when they succeed and encouraging them when they fall. While our children are growing up, it's so important that we be there for them because one day they'll be responsible to be there for us. And as you think about these six qualities of, of a good shepherd, relationship with God, relationship with the children, a role model, spiritual leader, a protector or defender and servant, where do you need to focus? Where is God speaking to you in, in one of those areas? And, and my encouragement is to ask God for strength. Ask him for wisdom. Ask him for help. Sometimes parenting feels like an impossible job. But he's there for us. And then my other thought is, is talk to fellow believers in Christ for ideas and encouragement and, and prayer. If you don't have someone that you have as a prayer partner or prayer warrior, look for one. Pray for one. We need each other. We need to be helped along the way. I don't know how many times it's, it's been so helpful to talk to other parents that have gone through similar things. And they have good ideas and they have good thoughts. And sometimes it's older people. Look for someone that's more mature, that's raised their kids, maybe raised their grandkids. They're going to be a, a wealth of knowledge and experience that you can go to. Let's go ahead and go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you that we can call you Father. We thank you that you are the perfect 
role model for us. And Lord, as much as we want to know you and grow in our faith, we also want to pass that on to our kids and to our grandkids. And so, Lord, thank you for the model of Jesus Christ being our good shepherd. And help us to take from that things that we can do to be better parents, uh, better grandparents, better mentors, better teachers. And may we continue to invest in the next generation. Father, our, our country is in such bad shape in so many ways. And some of that is a leadership vacuum in the home. And I, I pray that whether we're dads or whether we're moms or grandparents or or single people, Lord, that you would give us opportunities to encourage those that are coming along the way, that we'd be the ones that they can look to, to see, well, they did it, they made it. Maybe I can follow that, their example. So, Lord, I pray that we would be good examples as we follow you, as we seek to know you more. And, Lord, I pray for any that might not know you as their Lord and Savior, that they don't have that relationship with you, that they would put their faith in you, that they would acknowledge their sin, their, their selfishness, their, their waywardness, their independence from you, and accept Jesus as their Lord and Savior. We thank you for all this in Jesus' name. Please stand with me as we sing the first verse of Only Trust Him.